Hey, Luke, um, when you and I last spoke, I think, on television, it was Thursday while we were waiting for the release of this report, and it's now, uh, I believe, Monday, if, I'm, if, my, if I've got my calendar straight, mm. which means that there have been a few days uh, that normal people would spend opening uh, presents and, and, uh, and unplugging from the work grid. I know that's not what you've been doing. You've been, like, plowing through whatever documents have been released uh, in the time, intervening time. I, I, want, I just want to ask you from, from, from a slightly higher perspective, like stepping up a little bit into the clouds here, now that you have your arms around, we have the final report has been has been put out. As you said, you're making your, you and your colleagues are making your way through it. You know that there are some more. There are still interview transcripts to come out in the course of this week. What what's in terms of either documents that are, you're waiting for, like with some eagerness because you think they might be important, or things that you're still going through documents that you think uh, where there can be advances in the story that are material. What's ahead? Uh, for, for the that's what's left to be exhausted that might yield something that genuinely moves the needle on this investigation as opposed to kind of adding just some kind of uh, illuminating color. Right. Yeah, I think that's a that's a central question. Um, you know, we do have more than 200 interview transcripts left to be released uh, at, at minimum that I know about. Um, so th there could be some explosive new evidence in there. But generally, you've got to figure if there was a, a big finding, that's already been in the report or a hearing. So generally from these transcripts, we're finding new interesting details, some new color, maybe some new stuff that adds a little more to the mountain of evidence that we've already seen. But you've, you've got to believe at this point, if there's going to be any really material revelations that change the course of events, that's going to be have that's going to have to be done by either the Justice Department or the prosecutors in Georgia. You know, they're going and they're re-interviewing a lot of these same people and sometimes in some cases new new people. And they do have in some cases greater investigative tools and abilities than a congressional committee would have. So, you know, I think if there's going to be additional real big breakthroughs, that's going to have to be done by prosecutors. And what we're likely to see from these transcripts is, yes, more damning information, but probably unlikely to change what we already know from what the January 6th committee has discovered and put out. So, Luke, we mentioned the sweeping piece that you co-authored for The Times, and in it you talk about the unheard of amount of power that Congresswoman Liz Cheney wielded as committee vice chair. I will quote you, back to you right here, as the stress and friction among staff and committee members grew, one constant source of conflict became increasingly acute. How Liz Cheney had turned the typically ceremonial role of vice chair into a position of unmatched power much the same way her father transformed the vice presidency 20 years earlier. Cheney had a significant hand in the writing and editing of the scripts. She also shaped the committee's interview process down to who was, serve, who was served subpoenas and the lines of questioning. Some staff members worried that the vice chairwoman could be using the committee's platform to advance her own political future. Though reviled by the Republican base and its avatar, Trump, Cheney did not renounce her party affiliation, and her roots remained deep. Unlike her father, when he accepted Bush's invitation to be his running mate in 2000, Liz Cheney had at no time publicly vowed that her designs on higher office were behind her. You continue. What was impossible to ignore in the end was Cheney's contribution to a committee that was expected to flounder as so many other congressional hearings had before it. The vice chairwoman was its most public-facing member. And her position of leadership complicated the assertions by members of her own party that the January 6th inquiry was nothing more than a Democratic witch hunt. Luke, talk, take us a little further behind the scenes there in terms of tension, it sounds like, between Cheney and her fellow committee members. Right, well, I think there were uh, more tensions with members of the staff than there were necessarily internally among the members. But yeah, Liz Cheney took what is normally a ceremonial role in a committee, a vice chair, which is, you know, usually doesn't have any real roles or responsibilities. And she slowly, over time, became the most powerful uh, and important member of the January 6th committee. And she didn't do this through some sort of, you know, sneaky uh, overtaking of the committee. It was that as she basically outworked every single person, including staff, I mean, uh, sitting in on uh, um, the vast majority of the interviews, reading almost every transcript, uh, becoming super aware of every detail of the, of the multi-part uh, plan to overturn the election, 
other people started to cede ground to her because they saw how how into it she was, how driven she was. And so when she would speak at a meeting, she spoke with this really high level of authority and backed with all the facts and the evidence. And so she became this sort of singular force on the committee. And, you know, she was always uh, deferential to Chairman Thompson when Chairman Thompson had an idea or wanted to steer the committee in one way or another. That always took uh, took shape. But uh, uh, there was a lot of deferring to Liz Cheney and how um, the January 6th committee operated. And one thing that all of the members told me, including the Democrats, was they could not have gotten some of their key witnesses in the door without Liz Cheney uh, and some of her top staff who had, you know, deep ties to the Republican Party and were well-respected within conservative circles. And that some of these Republicans uh, would never have spoken with the committee if Liz Cheney hadn't asked them to do so. So, and if, and if you recall... Nearly every witness at these hearings was a Republican. And so I think it made a lot of them feel more comfortable to have a Republican and a Republican staff who are bringing them in the door.